I think the winning team is the one that has all the right skill sets that are necessary to launch a successful product. So Oberla was launched by five founders and we had front and back end skills, design, product and marketing. So it was a very self-sustaining team. So that was really great. We were all very pro doers. So we were not very kind of theoretic or strategic or kind of philosophers. We were doing, and, and that's what's beautiful about startups is that they are not talking a lot, they are doing a lot. And I think that's kind of, especially at the very beginning, is just very important because how can you build anything by just talking? Hello and welcome. This is Ruta Noyokaite, and you're listening to Lithuanian Dream Podcast a podcast exploring ideas about contemporary Lithuania. Today we have a special episode to anyone interested in Lithuanian startups. Thomas Schlimmes is the best example of Lithuanian entrepreneur who managed to build and sell their startup just in two years. Oberlo is a dropshipping platform that now is a part of Shopify Thomas Schlimmes remained director of marketing in Shopify and is managing Oberlo in this product. We will talk with him about the challenges of making a business, selling Lithuanian company to Canadians and growing Oberlo within the Shopify. Thank you for joining us today, Thomas. Thanks for inviting me. Glad to be here. So I decided to invite you in order to help our listeners to understand what your company does. And next time they see Oberlo or Shopify name, then they could say, hey, actually I heard the story and they could talk about it and promote more Lithuanian businesses. So I work at Shopify and before joining Shopify, I started a company named Oberlo. And both at Oberlo and now at Shopify, we're helping aspiring entrepreneurs start businesses. That's kind of the role that I'm in. And we do that by giving them solutions that would make starting a business easier. And by doing that, more people can start businesses. So Oberlo in particular is a tool that helps you dropship products. Dropshipping is an e-commerce method where you set up a store, you take products from your supplier's catalog, you sell those products. And when you make a sale, you inform your supplier that that product has been sold. And then the supplier ships that product directly to your customer and you profit the difference between kind of the retail price and the wholesale price. So you never touch the product, you never see it. So it's kind of an e-commerce model. And so Oberlo helps with that. And, and then Shopify helps with setting up the store. And then Shopify has a bunch of other tools that makes your life easier as a beginner entrepreneur. So I'm operating in that space and yeah, I'm very excited about it. So how did you came across drop shipping, shipping as a field where to start company? Sure. So uh, I was one of those people who wanted to start an e-commerce store and aspired to be an entrepreneur. So uh, I started my career like nine years ago and I started doing e-commerce. I had an e-commerce uh, store selling interior design products. I had a secondhand bookstore, all sorts of things. And then at some point, one of those stores was a store selling products from China based on a drop shipping model. And my brother and I was running that store for like over a year. It scaled quite well. And then we sold that store to our suppliers in China. And then we just looked for what we could do next. And we decided to help others do the same thing as we did. Okay. So did it take long to actually crack the model and, you know, start this kind of company? Were there technical things you, you needed to solve before setting it up? So we didn't have any grand ambitions. So we were not building a product that we imagined. I had a vision for it like five years in. It happened all very organically. So we sold that our e-commerce store and we just like, I guess the next month launched four very scrappy made, very simple apps on the Shopify app store. One of them was helping with drop shipping, the other helped with tracking your orders. So basically a, a plugin that helped your store customers track their orders. I never helped optimize images. So it was like a very organic transition from having my own store to launching a bunch of apps together with friends that would help other store owners. And it wasn't technically hard because we were not building a product. We were just like, hey, why don't we just ship these things? And I mean, to be honest, they were really, really scrappy. Like when we launched the Burlo, like it didn't even help you 
he didn't even let you fulfill orders. So like you had to manually let your supplier know that you sold the product. Like there was no automation there. So it was just a little bit better than email, but just slightly better than that. It sounds like a lean startup, which is very fashionable now just to start and then keep growing and changing your product. So tell me about that time, like how quickly you needed to innovate and how much feedback did you receive after putting that on the App Store? Sure. So we just published it. We didn't have like a reputation to save or we really didn't know what we were doing. So if we knew what we were doing, then we would have probably spent more time building out a product because we would have known what the features should be. But honestly, we just were very opportunistic and did what seemed right at that point without any like big plans or ambitions. So that's how we built it. It happened to be lean startup. So we shipped something that kind of partially works. And then we really listened to our customers and App Store, any App Store, like Shopify App Store, Apple App Store, Google Store, like all of these App Stores gives you free traffic at some level. And that free traffic is very valuable because you get very early feedback without the need to acquire those customers. So like you publish an app on the Shopify app store, there are people on that app store every day. Shopify takes care of that. Some of them stumble upon your app and they try it out. And then they give you feedback that they hate it or love it or why and why. So we just published those apps. We didn't care much about marketing. A few people installed it and they said they love it and they like this part or that part. And we kind of worked on that feedback. So it also happened very organically and it happened to be lean startup. I think, I mean, we are launching new products within Shopify too. It's much less lean just because we are a little bit more certain what we are doing. We have those customers already. I mean, a million, over a million merchants are using Shopify today and, and we can ask them what do they need and they tell us and we don't have to ship something that we know they need but doesn't work. We only can ship something that they need and we and we know it works like we've built it well. So it's a different dynamics. I don't think there is a right or wrong answer in any situation. It really depends on the circumstance. And you mentioned having a team from very start. So what would you say now looking backwards is a strong team? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think it really depends again on the circumstances, like the team, the ideal team to launch products within a company like Shopify, which is right now 7,000 people, is very different than a team to launch products, ideal team to launch products as a startup alone. So generally, I think the winning team is the one that has all the right skill sets that are necessary to launch a successful product. So Oberla was launched by five founders and we had front and back end skills, design, product and marketing. So it was a very kind of uh, self-sustaining team. So that was really great. We were all very pro doers. So we were not very kind of theoretic or strategic or kind of philosophers. We were doing, and, and that's what's beautiful about startups is that they are not talking a lot, they are doing a lot. And I think that's kind of, especially at the very beginning, is just very important because how can you build anything by just talking? And that is important here. And I really think that's it. I mean, a team that listens to your customers, does things, is constantly learning because you just can't stop failing. So you really have to like have a positive mind and learn a lot from those things. And a skill set that works well in combination. If like we were five marketers, I think we would have failed quite miserably. So you had a product, different little apps in the app stores, different ones. And you had a team and the idea to, to do something. And at which point you understood that this is not just a, you know, a test or another idea, but it can grow into something big. So what happened is, is we really listened to our customers. We really asked them why you're using Oberlo and how you're using it and at which point you decided to use it and why. So like we really listened to them. I mean, when we were building Shopify apps, we thought of like, we were going to help Shopify app, uh, Shopify merchants. So people like us who were running an e-commerce store and they needed some help with a particular thing and a particular task. And, and we thought we'll ship these apps and help them. And as we listened to them, we realized that none of them were Shopify merchants when they started using us. So apparently people who need help with supply chain are people who haven't started stores yet because people who have a store already, they have figured it out. Like if you have a store and you're selling something, well, you have probably figured out where to get those products from because, I mean, you are selling them already. And even if you are selling them from China, like you still already have Chinese partners. So for us... A product we were building was apparently only relevant to people who didn't have a store just yet, and they were looking for help with that. So 
as I kind of look back, we really listened to them. And when we realized that, we thought, hey, our audience is not a million Shopify merchants. Our audience is like hundreds of millions of people around the world who want to start a business. And that's just a very different opportunity and just a very different challenge. And we really focused on that. So we were lucky to kind of stumble upon these findings in the first five months of the business. And we really, really kind of doubled down on these findings and did a lot of marketing to people who want to start a business, built like huge content marketing engine that created content for these people and really just built an audience. And I think that's what Shopify got excited about. And that's what we continue doing to this day. So how did you gather the feedback? Because I think, especially in early starts of the business, there needs to be balance because people tend to be reactive sometimes, just getting you know, a few sets of feedback and then they start making changes or others start making these huge Excel spreadsheets with, like, I don't know, 20 columns, trying to really go into detail, but then getting overwhelmed with all this information and not knowing where to focus. So how did you process that data and actually made some kind of decisions? I mean, I'm not a researcher, and there are researchers who know different methods of how to synthesize data and get great conclusions from that. In my mind and in my kind of experience, I've always had a rough focus. Just because I, I wasn't smart enough, I didn't try to find precise answers. And there is this saying that it's better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. So I think that's very important because, yeah, like it's going to be a, a bet eventually. And you don't have to like, I mean, I keep seeing everyone building these like massive questionnaires and then scoring every answer and trying to build like a, an output that would tell them the future. But like, there is no such thing and it, it's just going to be directional. So you, you got to figure out how do you make bets that have a way back so you don't like lose all of your money and you don't bet all of your assets or all of your time on something and you don't just do something like terribly wrong. And step by step, I, I guess you'll get to the right point. So in our case, we've stumbled upon this finding. And instead of trying to figure out whether it's absolutely right, we just kind of worked on it. And I think the first thing that I did was, hey, if our audience is not Shopify merchants. Let's do something that would reach people who are not Shopify merchants. So, I mean, it was as simple as that. And, and what I did, I went to Reddit and I said, hey, I had a store selling products from China. We made over $3 million in sales during the first year, asking anything about marketing, a supply chain or anything, literally. And on Reddit, these Ask Me Anything sessions are very popular. So I got like 500 questions during the first night and I spent like 10 hours nonstop answering them. And it was really, really kind of massive. And we've noticed that so we did that and, and that got a lot of attention. It brought quite a few Overlo users. And we said, hey, like we just stumbled upon this finding that our audience could also be non Shopify merchants. We acted on that finding. So instead of theorizing, strategizing, like we just went ahead and like, hey, let's do something about it. We did something that didn't require a lot of investment. If it didn't work out, like we could have just said, you know, whatever, like let's move on. So we went ahead, did something about it and saw that it, it had positive signals, and, and then we continued building on top. So I think it's just very important not to try to find absolute truth because there is no absolute truth. Just kind of go ahead and not try to lose all of your money, not try to like totally ruin your company or idea, just little by little, like, you know, work your way up. So when did you decide to sell them to Shopify? You were doing all these things. You discovered that there are different users. So when was that point when you were like, okay, we need to go now even bigger? Yeah, so it's really not like a decision you come up with sitting in a living room. It's again, very organic. At some point when we were like a year old, Shopify's VP of growth reached out, uh, Bruno Roldan, a very smart guy. And he took the chance and said, hey, I'd like to visit you in Lithuania. So he and his colleague, Michael Klein, came down to Lithuania. It was a very long journey. They didn't probably even know where Lithuania is at that point. And so they took this bet and, and they came here and, and we really liked them and they really liked us. And we had a, a lot of long conversations about e-commerce and what could we do together and how things work in this industry. And it was really, really exciting. And we continued that conversation for like half a year. And at some point we realized that where this is heading. And we understood that they're going to present us an offer because they want us to be on their team. And honestly, we wanted to be on their team as well. So we made the decision to join Shopify and we joined. And we don't regret that choice because, I mean, since then, Shopify has grown in, in 10x. And 
I mean, I joined Shopify three years ago now, and 70% of the Shopify folks joined after me. So you can just imagine what kind of growth that is. So today it's like 7,000 people. When I joined, it was like 1,500. So it's really growing massively. There's many opportunities to learn things that you wouldn't have, an opportunity you wouldn't have anywhere else. So I'm excited about it and kind of the reason why we joined them, because we really liked them as a team. We liked the idea. We believed in the company. And so far, it proved to be the right decision. Tell me more about that half a year when you were talking with them. It sounds like it was quite a big trust building exercise and you needed to understand certain things like team, what can you expect later and for them as well. So I think a lot of people who are listening maybe as well thinking about starting a business. So I think it would be very useful to understand that process. Sure. So there are different types of acquisitions. There are acquisitions where a company acquires another company just to reach a certain scale. So they are optimized. They are consolidating all their customers, all their customer support teams, let's say, operations, etc. So it's kind of an optimization activity where they want to reach more people at a lower cost on average. So anyways, there's this type of acquisition. Then there are acquisitions where someone hired, uh, someone acquired the company and closed their product and then just integrated all of their people into the company. So it's kind of like aqua hire where you acquire and hire people. Then there is product acquisition where you're acquiring a company because you like their product and you would like to build that product yourself. But why would you do that for like two years in house? And like, you know, it's a bigger company. Everything is moving slower, et cetera. You could just kind of advance your roadmap and acquire that company yourself. So there are various types of acquisitions. And the one we were at the shop final Berlo, I think was a mix of aqua hire and product acquisition. So our product is still live and running. And they were looking for how could they enter this space that we've kind of uncovered. And instead of building their product uh, from scratch, could just acquire someone and let them build the product for them. So it was like the product acquisition as well as the aqua hire because all of our team has joined. In any case, I think the challenge for many companies is how do you find people to lead these products and lead these opportunities? Because, I mean, many companies and, and many individuals, to be honest, have tons of money everywhere. Like even in Lithuania, even in Vilnius, there are many people who have a lot of capital. It's just that where would you deploy it? And you can't do it all alone. And also, there are so many opportunities, but like you can't really find people to just trust and, and give your capital to build out these opportunities. So for Shopify, I think it was, hey, we really want to enter that space. We have a ton of cash. We can't do it in-house because we don't really have anyone who would understand a thing about this space. And also it would take so long to hire someone and trust someone. So I think that six months was just a very long hiring interview from their side. And for us, it was, we are joining them. It, we know it's going to be a long-term thing. We know that we need to like them. Otherwise, we'll just kind of you know, go away. So it, it was a good getting to know exercise. Again, we are very excited to be uh, among Shopify folks. So tell me about that day when this Canadian company was coming to Lithuania. We already had the Gin Bokus who brought the Western Union to Lithuania, telling us about his experience bringing, you know, Americans to Lithuania in like early 2000s. And how did it feel for you guys? And how did you try to charm them or to show that they're welcome and all these things? So there's been many uh, Canadian folks from Shopify who has come to Vilnius or Lithuania over the last three years. And I think the, the one thing that I constantly keep hearing is that Vilnius is super underrated. So I think when you land here, I mean, apart from the small airport, you are met with a very Western looking city with very nice people, many great restaurants and places to go beautiful architecture, beautiful weather, especially in the summer. So it's really like an amazing city. And especially for someone from the US and, and Canada, we need to understand that for them, Europe is a thing. Whereas for us, a kind of North America is a thing. So for them coming down here is, I think it's, they are like pleasantly met with a very positive experience. Whereas I think in their minds, they are thinking of like some formerly occupied country, which probably is very kind of backwards, backwards looking. And I mean, you could think of all the weird things that you would meet here. So, and I think they are pleasantly surprised that they are met by different things. 
what's the difference between the business culture of Lithuania and Canada and Germany, I guess, because you have office there too, right? Yeah, I think the the culture between Canadian companies and Lithuanian companies is pretty similar. I mean, I think Canada is just much more multicultural. So like there is just a much bigger diversity than there is in Lithuania. But like in terms of work culture or the way work is done, I think it's it's pretty similar because maybe, I mean, aside Toronto, I think there are not so many opportunities as there are, let's say, like in Berlin. And people are much more loyal to the companies that they've joined because they can't turn around and find another opportunity they come to appreciate the opportunities that they are that they are finding. And I think companies also understand that. And in that environment where there are not so many opportunities, they invest in people so and teach them how to do things and invest in their education. Because you can't hire the best person who in like Facebook marketing because there are not so many companies where they could have received that experience. So I think in that space it's similar to Lithuania where like there are Lithuanian people don't really have so many opportunities in Lithuania, so there is less experience, but they are much more loyal to the companies that they join. And then companies are much more willing to invest in the employees because there is no other option, to be honest. Like you can't hire experienced people or at scale. And like that loyalty, then this kind of positive reinforcement loop. I think in Berlin, the station is very different. Maybe Berlin is similar to Toronto, where like there are many opportunities. You can hire experienced people. Those experienced people like can just turn around and leave you. So as a company, you don't really invest so much in those people because, I mean, you can always find someone who is matching your experience that you need already. And also, you know that, I mean, by investing, there is a very high likelihood that you will lose that employee anyways because they will turn around and, and switch. So I think it's just different dynamics across different cities. So I think like Ottawa, where Shopify is headquartered, and Lithuania is pretty similar because uh, of these dynamics, whereas Toronto, where Shopify has a big office, and Berlin is similar because they are like, you know, on a different level. So I think that would be the separation that I would make. And what about smiling? I keep hearing that people say that we Lithuanians need to smile more, especially when we meet people from US or Canada and like, don't look so serious. Um, is it still like that? Yeah, it's funny. I don't think smiling is a thing. I think the ease of chit-chatting is the biggest challenge. I remember the point where I was sitting with this guy, Michael Klein, who was the first uh, to come to Lithuania. And we were chatting what, what one should respond to, you know, someone asking you, how's it going? How are you? And things like that, because usually when you're welcomed or when someone kind of meets you, sees you, they say, hey, how's it going? And should you reply to that or not? And should you also ask how's it going? And that chit chatting is very hard to keep up with if your English isn't great, like conversational English. And I don't think that's a challenge per se. I think people who like Americans, let's say, who come to Lithuania and they stay here they understand that we are not replying to the chit-chatting because we are rude. They understand that we have barriers, which is totally fine. I mean, at least we know two languages, whereas Americans, probably majority of them know only one. So I think it's a very good thing, like even us trying to know English. But it's just that I think the initial impression for any foreigner trying to be super positive and chit-chatting with us and receiving like, you know, a very kind of neutral, no emotions responses might seem rude at first. So I think that's what we are fighting with, like the first impressions. I think later on, as you get to know the person, you understand that that person has nothing against you. That person is really funny and really cool and really exciting. And they smile when they need to. But I think that initial impression is hard for us to make because we don't have an arsenal of like, cool greetings or words or chit chats to start the conversation. How is it to manage international office? And now you have 7,000 people. How does marketing differ from having, you know, a small company quickly growing to a big company that is scaling very fast? Yeah, I probably don't even know all the challenges that our executive team is facing. So, uh, I mean, at a scale of 7,000 people, the leadership team is I think right now there is like over 200 directors and up at Shopify. So the leadership team is way bigger to such a big organization. So I obviously don't even know what are the challenges. But yeah, I think as you scale, the challenges become of how do you run a team? Like, I think 
at the end of the day, the company is the team, is the people behind it. Without the people, there would be no company. Without the people, there would be no marketing. Like if you take the people out, like Shopify wouldn't be it. You know, you can't just replace the people. Like people make up Shopify. And, and those people come with all sorts of different personalities and characters and all sorts of different skill sets, all sorts of different needs. And I think for you as a challenge, as you scale is how do you get together with these people and, and make sure that they are moving to the direction that you've set uh, with your vision? And how do you make sure that they are all moving in one direction, not in competing directions? And they are excited and they are set up for success. So they have the skill sets to solve the challenges they've been assigned to. Like, you know, if, if you put a enthusiastic enthusiastic marketer who's not good at math in in paid marketing position like that would be a terrible uh, combination but if if you put that same person on content marketing that would be wonderful because content marketing is a very creative endeavor so i think there's just many more people challenges in a positive way i think like that's something inevitable that you have to solve as you grow Whereas at the beginning, the smaller company, maybe it's fewer people challenges. It's more like product challenges, tactical challenges. So it seems like you are focusing a team and keeping the team happy. So the happy people would make good products. And I saw amazing videos you have on your YouTube channel with advice for entrepreneurs, what they should sell actually uh, during COVID-19 and your content marketing is amazing. What kind of initiatives uh, do you have now within the marketing of Shopify that actually work? Because you're, you know, sort of responsible for that area, right? Thank you. So again, Shopify marketing team is very big and there's many things that uh, the folks are doing. And I know that other teams are working on guides and webinars and content that would help retail stores, brick and mortar stores move online. And that's been very helpful during these times for businesses that are facing struggles. So there, there's many things that people are doing, particularly on Oberlo, uh, we've been always focused on how could we help aspiring entrepreneurs make the most out of the current situation they are in and or the current kind of stage of the year or kind of the season. So like if it's right now back to school season, we would be recommending a lot of like back to school season products and promoting the opportunity to like enter, kind of enter entrepreneurship, start the store selling these products because it's a very good time. And, you know, in a month or uh, a few months, there's going to be a high season, BFCM, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Christmas season. That's going to be a, like a very good sales period for retail. And, and we're going to ship out a lot of content that suggests people what is the good strategy and tactics to be successful beginner entrepreneur during these times. And, and during COVID, we did the same, like, hey, world has changed. We have to accept that and acknowledge that. And we shipped out a lot of content, which tried to turn around this station and say, yes, the world has changed, but here are the things that you could do to start the store and, and make it a success. And, and a lot of people did. So, yeah, we are excited about that on the Oberlo front. It's amazing to see how passionate you are by what you do. So what drives you to grow, keep doing what you're doing for quite many years now? Thank you. I think that the motivators are changing, as I guess for many people. So for a long time, my drive was, well, just money. Like I really wanted to make it and have an apartment to live in and not share it with like a few strangers and had a car and kind of just reach a, a decent comfort. And after that, I've reached that. I think I'm still spending time trying to figure out what's my purpose in life and what's the long-term goal that I have. But the biggest driver that I have right now is after I've figured out the first question was like learning. I mean, I'm trying to get the most out of the opportunities that I'm presented and lucky to kind of get. And I'm trying to learn as much because all of this knowledge can be applied in the opportunities that I will have in the future. So I think Shopify gave me an amazing opportunity to be a part of this high growth, massive company and help many, many entrepreneurs around the world. And that's a huge driver for me personally. And also, it's just much more fun to help people start stores and do something more meaningful than, you know, just, just. I mean, there are just many companies that don't do anything meaningful. And and so I think it's just Shopify is a great company to be in because of that. And I'm just very driven by all the opportunities it gives me to learn things. 
Do you recall any success stories, maybe from your employees or maybe the customers that uh, really sort of gave you that push and saying, hey, this is meaningful what we are doing? Oh, all the time. I mean, over a million merchants are using Shopify and there are many, many stories, crazy stories of, of people coming from various circumstances and very negative ones and Shopify changing their lives. I mean, they are changing their own lives. Uh, with their own decisions and their own motivation and grit. It's just that Shopify helps and was a part of that journey. And even on a Burlo side, and I think on Shopify side, there is stories section where you can find these stories. Um, there's definitely a lot of stories on, on YouTube where people like they, they were really trying many things and really trying hard to achieve their dreams, whether that's making money, creating an incredible product, and kind of travel the world while working remotely. Like there's many dreams people have, aspirations, and Shopify was a part uh, of the solution to those dreams. So there's many. I can't really identify one, but I will make sure I will add the link to, in our comments so then people can just watch it. What kind of advice then would you give to a person, to yourself maybe, when you were starting Overlaw? Yeah, I don't think there is one advice. I mean, it's a very good question because it, it would be helpful to boil down everything into one advice as a, as a takeaway for the audience. But I think, to be honest, there is no one advice. And I think everyone's circumstances is very, very different that trying to apply one advice to each case would be just like that. There is the saying that like to a man with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And I think we cannot try to fit that one advice to every case. So in my case, at those circumstances where I was surrounded by people who knew engineering and new design and new product, my advice was, I think, would have been just kind of keep focusing on traffic, try to generate demand. That's what you do best. That's how you best kind of contribute to this team and kind of just go ahead and do things. I mean, for someone who's in a very different circumstances, that advice would never fit. So in any way, I would kind of paradoxically advise people to to look at their case and, and try to really lay down all the building blocks where they are at and where they're trying to get and try to really understand not what successful people did, uh, but more so what options do they have and whether they lack some skills or not, whether they have understanding of a particular market or not, where their knowledge kind of ends and try to be honest with themselves of like really the station they are in and with that in mind try to find the next step and be very decisive like spend time really asking yourself in words like where you're at but after you've done that be very decisive and just go ahead and do it. and i think that would be kind of my long answer to a very simple question of yours it's quite an important answer, I think, as well, that kind of a decision-making process and, you know, assessing what to do is quite a valuable advice. Thank you for that. Yeah. And overall, like, you had a strong team. And what do you think, how can people find a strong team and what is actually in people we should look for? Yeah, it's definitely extremely hard to find team and partners. And I think the only way to find them is through building relationships. So exposing yourself to a chance of meeting a new person. So like, I mean, obviously, if you're sitting at home, you will never meet a new person. If you're hanging around Reddit forums, there is a higher chance you'll meet someone. If you're going to like meetups or anywhere, like it's, there's another kind of layer of meeting other people. So expose yourself to meeting new people. And instead of trying to just close them and say, hey, let's build a, a company, I think spend time forming relationships. I think building relationships is underrated and it takes time to build good relationships and trust. And that is very important, especially building a company. So build relationships. And in terms of building relationships, I'm, I'm, I'm no relationships expert, but like trust is probably important and, and you got to trust that person. Hopefully you meet someone that will never do bad things about you that is kind of kind of incredible person. I mean, I'm, I'm no relationship expert on that point. I would just suggest like build time, take time building out relationships and expose yourself to a chance of meeting people and kind of whether that's a good or a bad person. I think there is just everyone knows their own tactics of how to identify that. And for people who already have a company and trying to sell Lithuania as a great place for doing business, maybe, what kind of advice would you give as well about what can we be proud of while being from Lithuania as businesses? 
I mean, I can definitely say we are super hardworking, but I, I think I would just probably frame this question as, I think you should look at what individual you could be proud of because that's a thing that you can control and identify that and, and make sure that you work on that harder than you've ever been. So if you think that I'm proud of because I'm hardworking, then double down on that. If you think I'm proud because I'm, I'm really good at AI and my team is very good at that and, and we are very good at that and we are making Lithuania proud because of that and I'm proud of that and I think you should focus on that. I don't know if there is a general kind of description of what we should be proud of. I think there are many things that we should be proud of, but also we have to understand that, uh, I mean, we were cheap for a long time. We aren't so cheap anymore. And I think our competitive advantage of cheapness is disappearing. And as our average price in Europe as others, we should look for what should what could be our other next competitive advantage when price is not the case anymore. And maybe that's tech. Maybe that's some other industry, but I think the the broader competitive advantage and, or a broader thing that we could be proud of will take time to, to form on the national level. For sure. Let's be the change we want to see. And the last question, as we are Lithuanian Dream Podcast, I always ask our interviewees, the people who come on the podcast, what is your personal dream for Lithuania for coming decades? My dream would be that we actually find that competitive advantage. I, I think Lithuania is doing really well on that front, to be honest. We are very ambitious. And if there is a crypto boom, we are the first to like introduce laws that makes that easy and kind of create a kind of wellness center, municipal centers or national centers on that. So if there is FinTech, we are really fast to act on that. And I think I really am excited about Lithuania being open to find their kind of their identity and I think through that, we'll find our competitive advantage. So I'm excited. And my dream for Lufania would be to continue doing that and really settle on something that will make us unique in this world. And also, on the other hand, I think just to be a little bit more open and have more like public discourse on important topics, because right now there's none. And we have a very one way of communication in terms of politics or social life or anything of that sort. I think there's not much of that in, in Lufania yet. So my dream would be that there would be more of that. Thank you so much for sharing your story. For our listeners, thank you so much for joining us today. In case you want to know more about Lithuanian businesses, just go on our website, lithuaniandreampodcast.com and click on the section Businesses. And there you can find more stories, including the co-founder of Dogo, Rasa, who will tell you about their story and the story of Western Union coming to Lithuania.